Miercolics, members of Parliamentary Assembly, Now I'd like to visually welcome you all at our winter meeting in Vienna. It's our statutory meeting, which Austria hosts every year for a festival of this. And uh, at this meeting, we're delighted to have speaker of the Parliament, the President of the Parliament, and a very good friend of our assembly. And I'd like to, let's say, once again, reiterate that it's a huge amount of support for the Austrian Parliament, the work of Parliament. We are grateful to have first time in this capacity chairperson in office of the OEC and the Minister of Foreign Affairs, Slovakia, Miroslav Lajic, and he will address the Parliamentary Assembly. After a few minutes, I would like to also repeat that. You know, Mr. Lajic is a, in his personal capacity at this moment, most important person in our OSC family. And uh, I think his own personal qualities and his disposition in the parliamentary assembly determines, I think, the future of our benefits of work. And of course, here we have our Secretary General of the OEC, great friend and colleague and ally, and there are many, many things uh, which I can say very positive to Thomas Greninger, who is really trying to promote the great atmosphere of, of uh, collegiality, of good work, attention to the Parliamentary Assembly, and also very Receptive and he understands all the needs and requirements from the parliamentarians, and we have very good cooperation. Thank you very much, dear friends. So, now uh, I'd like to ask for the first uh, remarks uh, President of the <coughs> National Council of Austria, Mr. Volker Sobotka, please, <coughs> President. Sehr geehrte Abgeordnete, Delegationsmitglieder, sehr geehrter Herr Präsident, äh, lieber derzeitige Vorsitzender, Außenminister Leitschak, Herr der Generalsekretär, ich freue mich, dass ich Sie heute, das ist mittlerweile schon zum 18. Mal, wo Sie in Wien tagen, darf ich hier das erste Mal in meiner Funktion recht herzlich begrüßen. Vor allem, wenn ich hineinsehe, dass ich den einen oder anderen auch schon kennenlernen durfte auf meinen Auslandsreisen oder auf seinen Wien-Besuchen. Ich freue mich auch, dass die Delegationen stärker denn je auch hier vertreten sind und es ist gar nicht gut, in Zeiten wie diesen, dass die parlamentarische Versammlung hier ein klares Signal setzt, und den klaren Willen hat letzten Endes den Geist der OECD aus 1972, der Helsinki-Akte, durch ihre Anwesenheit ein kräftiges Zeichen, ein kräftiges Zeichen für ein Miteinander. Warum der parlamentarische Dialog notwendig ist und notwendiger denn je, dass die Parlamentarier auf den verschiedensten Ebenen einen breiten Dialog fühlen einen breiten Dialog führen, der auch zum Verständnis der unterschiedlichen Standpunkte beiträgt. Und schon das sollte das Ziel sein, das Gemeinsame vor das Trennende zu stellen. Wenn wir uns die großen Politikfelder ansehen, dann wissen wir heute in der globalen Verantwortung, dass wir sie nur gemeinsam lösen können. Und wenn wir jeder nur seinen eigenen Vorteil sehen und seinen eigenen Egoismen leben, dass das nicht langfristig auch zum Nutzen des eigenen Landes ist. Die OSCT hat immer wieder bewiesen, dass sie in der Lage ist, gerade für Konfliktvermeidung in der Frage, Streitparteien auch zusammenzuführen, auch letzten Endes mit ihren vielen Missionen hier einen wertvollen Beitrag zur Erhaltung 
und Weiterführung des Friedens zu leisten. Und wir brauchen diese multilateralen Foren mehr denn je. Denn wenn wir uns ansehen, wo wir heute stehen, und wenn Sie heute, und manche von Ihnen sind schon sehr lange auch Parlamentarier, wenn Sie sich das vor Augen führen, wo wir vor 10, vor 15 oder vor 20 Jahren gestanden sind, dann, wenn wir das im Rückblick reflektieren, dann sind das heute Zeiten, die für alle Herausforderungen gekennzeichnet sind. Da sind viele Dinge wie in der Frage, in der, Frage der Digitalisierung, letztendlich auch den Möglichkeiten, wie wir kleine Konflikte nicht größer werden lassen und schlussendlich den großen Herausforderungen der Zusammenarbeit. Darüber hinaus, und das ist für uns, glaube ich, ganz wichtig, sehen wir, dass die Sicherheitsfrage eine ist, die alle betrifft. ist und von vielen auch heute bekämpft wird. Wir sind froh, wenn der Kampf gegen den ISIS gewonnen wird. Wir sind froh, wenn wir terroristische Organisationen mit einer gemeinsamen Haltung bekämpfen können. Und wir dürfen froh sein, und wir sollten froh sein, wenn wir das Leid, das in all diesen Konflikten die Zivilbevölkerung erfährt, wenn wir dieses Leid mindern. Die OSZD verfügt über eine ganz starke Grundlage, über ein Wertefundament zur Konfliktverhütung. Und die Grundprinzipien der OSZD aus den Schlussakten Helsinkis, die Souveränität der Staaten, die Unverletzlichkeit der Grenzen, die Souveränität auch, die die Menschenrechte begründen, das bewusste Bekenntnis zur Demokratie und vor allem zur Rechtsstaatlichkeit. Nur die Rechtsstaatlichkeit, die für alle Bürger gilt, ist das Mittel, um letztendlich das Leben der Menschen miteinander zu verbessern. Und dessen sollten wir uns eingedenk sein, dass das heute manchmal ausgehöhlt wird, ja manchmal bewusst missachtet wird, aufgrund der verschiedensten Entwicklungen. Nationalismen, kurzfristiges und kurzsichtiges Denken und schlussendlich einer wirtschaftlichen Herausforderung, einer klimapolitischen Herausforderung, der wir uns gegenüber sehen. Da ist ein offener und ehrlicher Dialog, wie ihn die OSZD pflegt, eine ganz eine wesentliche Voraussetzung. Und da braucht es auch Mut zum Kompromiss, da braucht es auch einen Mut, aufeinander zuzugehen. Und die Parlamente haben da eine ganz entscheidende Aufgabe, auch die Regierungen zu unterstützen, die Regierungen zu kontrollieren und den Dialog auch voranzutreiben. Wir sollten diesen Geist auf der OSZD gerade auf die handelnden Personen im Operativen der Regierung sehr stark auch weitertragen. Mit der Diskussion und auch mit der klaren Aufforderung, aufeinander zuzugehen. Mir ist besonders wichtig, gerade in diesem Jahr auch auf die menschliche Dimension, den Schutz der Menschenrechte hinzuweisen. Wir wissen, wie sie da und dort ausgehöhlt werden. Wir wissen, wie sie da dass Religion und Staat, die voneinander getrennt sind, manchmal nicht in dem verstanden werden, was eigentlich in der Menschenrechtskonvention grundgelegt ist. Und wir wissen, dass es ein starkes Bewusstsein dafür gibt, diese Menschenrechte sind die Freiheit und sind letzten Endes die Grundlage für die Freiheit jedes Einzelnen. Und ich bin überzeugt, dass die heutige Wintertagung mit ihren Dokumenten und letztendlich mit ihren Diskussionen einen wertvollen Beitrag leisten kann in eine positive Zukunft. Lassen wir uns nicht irritieren, wenn heute manches Abkommen nicht mehr wertgeschätzt wird. Lassen wir uns nicht irritieren, wenn manche einen Weg gehen, der insbesondere in der Beeinflussung über digitale Medien auch staatliche Souveränitäten beeinflussen. Lassen wir uns nicht irritieren von den einzelnen Konflikttreibern. Wir müssen, und da sind wir zu verpflichtet, der Menschlichkeit einen Raum zu geben, eine Bahn zu schlagen. Und dafür darf ich Sie aufrufen, in diesen strukturierten Dialogen, in diesen Feldmissionen, egal wo Sie sind, Ihren Beitrag weiter zu leisten. Die OECD 
ist unersetzlich. Sie hat ihren vielen Funktionen von Wahlbeobachtungen bis zu den drei Feldmissionen am Westbalkan, am Kaukasus und die Kaukasusgebiete in Zentralasien eine ganz entscheidende Rolle. Gar nicht davon zu reden, in ihren Spezialmissionen. Und es sind heute auch die Konfliktthemen sehr klar angesprochen. Wie gehen wir weiter um in dieser Situation in der Ukraine? Wie können wir Schritte entwickeln, für Langzeitkonflikte sie einer Lösung zuzuführen? Und was ist unsere Aufgabe in der Beobachtung der Menschenrechte und vor allem freier und transparenter Wahlen? Lassen wir unsere Grundrechte nicht ausüben zum Schutze unserer Bürgerinnen und Bürger der ganzen Menschheit. Und das soll auch ein Signal von dieser Wintertagung sein. In diesem Sinne, Alles Gute gut. nochmal herzlich willkommen. In Wien haben Sie mit guten Beratungen und nehmen Sie diesen Geist von Wien auch mit nach Hause. Sobotka for your important and inspirational remarks here. Again, uh, I'd like to greet uh, all of you as the President, Secretary General, uh, Chairman in Office, fellow parliamentarians, ambassadors, distinguished guests. Of course, it's my great pleasure to see you all in Vienna at the 18th winter meeting of our parliamentary assembly. Every year since 2002, this gathering uh, at the headquarters of the OSC has provided us the opportunity to hear from OSC experts and officials, to interact with ambassadors and delegations from our home countries, and to see, of course, and to set our sights on our annual session in July. First, uh, once again, express gratitude to OSC for their long-lasting support for parliamentary democracy and not only helping parliamentary assembly. My thanks also go to Secretary General Greminger. Uh, I shortly uh, try to characterize his also personal attitude and, and uh, uh, his, his uh, willingness to work very closely uh, with the parliamentarians and understanding that is a very important work. And I'm thankful, dear Thomas, uh, for all the efforts that you are offering and opening doors for parliamentarians for the different meetings and events and, and uh, let's say projects uh, in frame of uh, OSCE and the executive side. Uh, and of course, uh, as I said, we are very much delighted to have chairman in office, first time in his capacity, very experienced politician and I would say also my good friend and a friend of of Parliamentary Assembly, the person who really wants to make a lot of good things in an area of, in a big area of OSC, uh, with a very good intentions and very important priorities, we will outline them a little bit later. This direct uh, interaction with parliamentarians by the head of governmental side of the OSC is an important strength of our organization and demonstration of our transparent work. My dear colleagues, we meet today as tensions have reached new levels all across the OSC region. For the six consecutive years of our conversations, and it will be still dominated by the news of violence in eastern Ukraine, and not only that, but we have seen with the incident in the Sea of Azov and the Kerch Strait last November how fragile security is in wider Black Sea region. During the past week, SMM has witnessed approximately 37% increase in ceasefire violations and lost uh, of a long-range UAV in uh, non-government controlled areas of Luhansk. In the South Caucasus, we continue to hear head-wrenching 
stories of separated families and inaccessible and central homelands. While a high level commitment to intensify negotiations and reduce tensions renews the hope of set to settle Nagorno conflict over Nagorno Karabakh, I can only deplore the lack of progress in Georgia, where our citizens continue to live in fear of being kidnapped in any moment for venturing near the so called administrative line and also suffer a continuing practice of illegal borderization. But we have also witnessed some positive developments which deserve to be recognized as such. The resolution of the long-standing named dispute between Skopje and Athens is a crucial step for the Southeast Europe and should serve as a template for further advanced regional cooperation. The Transnistrian settlement process has also marked tangible progress and should also advanced an advanced resolution of other protracted conflicts in the OSCE region. We must build on these successful examples of international diplomacy, redouble our efforts, and complement our respective added values in good faith. This is a palpable, there is a palpable climate of dissatisfaction for a wide range of our populations. The Yellow West protests in France have captured our attention for several months now and have demonstrations also we have in Belgrade, Budapest and unfortunately most recently in Tirana. This set of domestic challenges should not come at the expense of important democratic reforms including in the electoral and the judicial spheres and nor serve to distract from strategic foreign policy priorities. In the shadow of Brexit, half of our countries will lay these concerns bare in European elections. In Moldova next week, in Ukraine and in North Macedonia, there are crucial elections coming up with various geopolitical implications. The refugee and migrant crisis that has been at the heart of European concerns for several years is now at the center of political debates in the United States. With uncertainty characterizing our political landscape, we are faced with even more uncertain times ahead. This was made evidently clear at the Munich Security Conference earlier this week, which also exposed how international order is under constant threat. And I know that some of our members, the leaders, they took part in this conference. All the alliances have been undermined by verbal clashes and treaties at the foundation of the post-Cold War order have crumbled. We should anticipate greater tensions and possible arms races that could escalate following the collapse of INF Treaty. Problems could emerge with Brexit and the complicated situation around the Irish border. We should be also mindful of the impacts that lay ahead with climate change. We must respond proactively to rollbacks of human rights standards by governments across the OSC area. The scope of these joint challenges demonstrates the need for greater transatlantic and pan-European cooperation. And it is precisely is that in this spirit I have recently visited with our Secretary General Washington and I'm very pleased to see a very important delegation from the United States Congress, Senators, Congressmen. It's great to have this, to show this engagement and cooperation. And multilateralism is a crucially important tool to assisting us, meeting our commitments and enable the next generations to inherit a better world. A noted politi political commentator once said uh, the most important four words in politics are up to a point. So we must ask ourselves up to what point we will allow commitments to go unfulfilled. At what point will people will serve no longer tolerate broken promises or the unfulfilled dreams of the post-Cold War period? Our people don't ask much from us and demand very basic expectations. Above all, they want a job, a safe 
environment, way to live and uh, decent education for the children and health care. Their demands are more than legitimate. Now more than ever, their voices remind us that it is time to ensure decisive actions. So let's work together and use the instruments already at our disposal. I listened to with great interest last month, last month when Foreign Minister Lajcik outlined the SOVAK Chairmanship Priorities 2019. Preventing, mediating and mitigating conflict with a special focus on the people it affects. Empowering women and youth in contributing to peace and security efforts. Adapting the OAC to new threats and recommitting to multilateralism. It is clear that there is much overlap between these priorities and what has been done and has been also the agenda for parliamentary assembly in that regard in the last several years. I recall in particular one sentence from Minister Lajcik's opening statement, Slovakia will dedicate the chairmanship to bringing the OSC closer to the people it is working for. Parliamentarians are ideally suited to reinforce that special link between our organization and the people. That should most benefit, that should most benefit from it, and I'm very confident that the governmental branch of the OSC appreciates this valuable avenue. And I think also Secretary Graminger will elaborate later on on this. It is a good sign that the Italian and Slovak chairmanships have offered me, in my capacity as president of the OSCPA, the opportunity to address Permanent Council twice per year. These are valuable opportunity to take stock of our cooperation, but also to advance criticism whenever it's appropriate. Working in close co coordination with the chairmanship, the secretariat, and OAC institutions, all of them, we have very good cooperation with all of the institutions. We must continue to push our countries and governments to achieve some tangible progress in putting an end to the crisis in and out Ukraine, protract, uh, protecting journalists, enabling uh, the contributions of civil society, or promoting the participation of more women, youth, and citizens who are underrepresented. Looking around the room here, I see strong national voices and leaders recognize the broad. We have among us several speakers of parliament, a number of former government ministers, and numerous politicians likely to be called to fulfill very important and high duties in the future. With such expertise, and wealth of experience on hand of the OEC, our ambitions are very realistic. Today we have clo close to 300 members of parliament from 55 participating states and four partners for cooperation present. Such numbers uh, really are a testament not only to the importance we all give to the OEC, but also to our collective desire to work together on issues that affect us all. I look forward to engaging in constructive deliberations this week. Yesterday already the ad hoc committee on countering terrorism um, met to plan the next steps uh, in its very active work. The ad hoc committee on migration will also gather today. Our economic and environmental committee will debate a timely issue with a good governance in the area of fighting corruption, money laundering and the financing of terrorism in the OSC region. The fight against corruption is an area where much progress can be done within the framework of multilateral cooperation. And I'm glad that we will also hear from the OSC Special Representative on combating corruption on this issue tomorrow. In our Human Dimension Committee, I expect an engaging conversation on the scope of legitimate restrictions of human rights in times of emergency with protracted and open conflicts in the OSC area and in the context of renewed terrorist threats, it will be interesting to discuss how to find the right balance between public safety and the safeguard of fundamental rights and freedoms. Finally, our Political Affairs and Security Committee meeting will be the opportunity to discuss the tools and mechanisms of the OSC to resolve protracted conflicts and hear what parliamentarians can bring to the table to complement these efforts. Throughout these debates, I invite you, dear colleagues, to engage actively 
with our guest speakers who are leading OSC efforts in Vienna, Warsaw, and Hague, and of course, the field missions and, and the, in the field. So we should continue to be open and further speak, further to see cooperation with our outside partners. It was, uh, I was very glad to see that yesterday's meeting of the Silk Road Support Group included lively discussions with our Austrian counterparts, the representatives of corporations, to encourage economic work and cooperation uh, ahead. Your suggestion and constructive criticism is always welcome. After all, we should seize on political influence to encourage greater political dialogue around the work of the OSCE with, with the aim of strengthening our organization. From our side, we will also continue to cooperate, it, to cooperate on this matter, conceptualize and implement reforms in the future. I'm pleased that we have already endorsed the standing committee today, this morning. We had a very, very lively discussion on different points in our standing committee. I'm very happy that we endorsed several fundamental principles in our electoral endeavors and electoral work and uh, observation missions, which is really one of the leading priorities and directions from the Parliamentary Assembly, with the aim to keep and to maintain prestige and credibility of our assembly and our observation missions. Let us also use our debates here in Vienna to nourish our conversation in our home countries. Let us continue to engage with our national parliaments and build on their oversight functions to push for the implementation of key OSC commitments. With the same intentions, we are launching new follow-up mechanism to support this process and we need really engagement and support of all the delegations in, in this effort. It is only working hand in hand and in the same direction that we can climb up and achieve concrete progress for our citizens. In this sense, as the president of, the, of this distinguished assembly, allow me to conclude by saying that I'm very proud with the spirit of collegiality and mutual respect that our assembly is capable to displaying, notwithstanding the challenging times upon us. I wish you much success over the next two days. I would now like to give floor to the Minister Lajcik. Thank you very much for your attention. President Saratoli, President Sobotka, Secretary General Greminger, Excellencies, Distinguished Parliamentarians, Ladies and Gentlemen. It's an honor for me to be here with you today to take a look at the security situation in our region and share with you our priorities and the vision for the OSC in 2019. Slovakia is taking the helm of the OSC with a sense of responsibility and seriousness, but most of all, with the utmost sense of urgency. Looking at the current state of international affairs, it is difficult not to feel a certain chill. Situation on the ground in many places in our region is alarming. We are witnessing series of smaller and bigger crises. Some of them sometimes seem endless. The challenges are big and fundamental. As President just mentioned, some of us just came back from the Munich Security Conference where, despite the sunny weather, you could feel the relations between old partners cooling down. While we cannot tell what the future will bring, and it's never been harder to predict, it is obvious that we will need management tools, old and established, as well as new ones, to prevent a situation when the relations and situations become irreversible. And our chairmanship believes that many of those needed tools are actually here at the OSCE. So as our number one priority, we want to use and develop the tools OSCE offers to prevent, mitigate, and resolve conflicts. How? First, by using practices and mechanisms already in place, such as the structured dialogue and security sector governance and reform. 
Second, by taking better advantage of opportunities and developing agendas like gender mainstreaming and greater participation of women in the security fields. I took a look at the participation list today and it seems that we have about 15 women heads of delegations here. And while I'm glad that we have 15 women heads of delegation here, I hope we will see this number rise in the future years. And third, by making full use of the OSC's presence on the ground. OSC field missions are doing a remarkable work. They contribute to easing civilian suffering and put our eyes where we cannot see from Vienna. And this is extremely important, especially as the crisis in and around Ukraine continues to undermine our principles and threatens our security. And it's the civilians paying the highest cost. So I used my visit to Ukraine last month to collect feedback from our monitors and appeal to our Ukrainian partners to actively promote a lasting ceasefire. I followed up with a visit to Moscow just this past Tuesday and I conveyed the same messages in support of dialogue to our Russian partners. I will actively continue leading the dialogue in Vienna, in capitals and on the ground where OSC is present. I have already traveled to Moldova, where we want to keep the positive momentum in the Transnistrian settlement process. The sides need to continue their constructive interaction and avoid unilateral moves that could hinder settlement process. Last week in Georgia, I had an opportunity to see the situation on the administrative boundary line between Tbilisi and Schinvali. Slovak chairmanship will fully back existing formats for conflict resolution. We welcome that the incident prevention and response mechanism meetings in Ergneti is back on track. Our team further plans for my visits to Armenia, Azerbaijan, the countries of Central Asia and the Balkans in the upcoming weeks and months so we can talk about challenges we are facing right on the spot. But we cannot limit our discussions to 2019 optics. The world is rapidly changing. New threats are emerging and we cannot let them catch us unprepared. So as our second priority, we will focus on providing for a safer future. For our institutions to remain relevant, we must prepare them for what's to come. The drafters of the Helsinki Act could hardly predict that decades later we will talk about the climate change or cyber warfare. New technologies and tools of statecraft, new interdependencies, new vulnerabilities are emerging. And this also means we will most likely need new tools in order to manage them. We need to adapt, open up space for new themes within the OSC, and generate dialogue about a safer future. To this end, our chairmanship will host topical conferences dealing with issues from terrorism to cybersecurity, to call attention to worrying trends and look for opportunities for cooperation. The first conference of this type already took place, 5th and 6th of February in Bratislava, addressing problems of combating modern day anti-Semitism. However, to prepare respons responsibly for modern opportunities and threats, first and foremost, we must band together. So as our third chairmanship priority, we want to promote multilateralism. We need allies. We need complementarity. And to this end, first, we need strategic partnerships with international organizations. All the members of the European Union are also members of the OSCE. We are all members of the United Nations. And we want to see how we can better harmonize and support mutual efforts. To this end, I will visit Council of Europe next week and engage with the United Nations Security Council in March. Second, we need to connect with non-governmental actors, think tanks, women's groups, youth networks, and other civil society partners. But let us start within the OSC family by better using existing channels for dialogue and ensuring inclusivity. Out of the OSC structures, parliamentary assembly brings the most plurality and diversity. Your input and action is critical 
to our collective success. Let me just mention three areas where, as I see it, we need the perspective and skills of parliamentarians the most. First, you are the link between the OSC and the people it serves. You come from all parts of our region, representing constituents from megacities to small towns, from agglomerations to countryside. You know how things work on the ground. You know best what concerns your people. You represent. You are the body best suited to ensure that the OSC is responsive to the aspirations of its citizens. You can bring their voices to this room and ensure our focus stays on people. But the organization also needs you to work the other way around, not only to bring cl people closer to the OSC, but also to bring OSC closer to its people, to convey our message and work to ex explain why it matters. You are in an opportune position to connect our organization with local political authorities, communities, neighborhoods, civil society, people on the ground. With that, you are playing a vital part in turning our regional obligations into national and local realities. Second, your engagement in election observation is crucial. In the past 25 years, over 6,000 parliamentarians and staff observed more than 170 different elections. Your presence adds credibility and international visibility to the electoral process. And I want to stress the importance of the OSC election observations as a flagship in consolidating democracy in the OSC region. For the OSC, election observation is a common endeavor involving the Office for Democratic Institutions and Human Rights, the OSC Parliamentary Assembly, and other parliamentary institutions. Your presence adds elected authority and international visibility to these common election observation endeavors. And especially at the time when we are heading towards numerous elections of critical importance. Moldova's parliamentary elections are the most important ballot in the modern history of the country. The conduct of these elections has potential to determine the light in which the international community will see Moldova. Also, importance of the upcoming presidential elections in Ukraine does not need any further emphasis. Our chairmanship will, of course, play its part. I will designate a special coordinator to lead the short-term OSC observer missions, as I did for Moldova, designating you, Mr. President. And I want to emphasize one more thing here. We all have high expectations from the OSC, but the election monitoring does not come free of charge. And its proper conduct is seriously endangered if we do not put the organization back on a sound financial footing. OSC is worth an investment. Cooperative security is worth an investment. After all, last year's unified OSC budget did not exceed the price of one average modern jet fighter. Lastly, I want to highlight how Parliamentary Assembly informs and inspires the work of our organization. Difficult times require creativity and innovation in responses, and we live in difficult times. We need new approaches and original proposals, and so far the Parliamentary Assembly has proven to be an excellent source of inspiration. Our focus on issues like trafficking in persons and combating intolerance is rooted in initiatives originally undertaken by this, this assembly. You have also been a key factor in the efforts to reform and modernize the OSC, such as through the Corfu process and the Helsinki Plus 40 initiative. And it was the recommendation of this assembly that led to creating the post of the representative on freedom of the media, to provide expertise in promoting media pluralism and safety of journalists. We highly appreciate his activities, as vibrant and free press is critical to sustaining the rule of law. And I want to emphasize this, and I want to emphasize this especially on this day. It is precisely one year since our society was left in shock 
after the murder of investigative journalist Jan Kuciak and his fiancée Martina Kushnirova. Our thoughts go out to their families and loved ones. We continue to strongly condemn this crime and place faith in the authorities to bring perpetrators to justice. Ladies and gentlemen, the major challenges facing the OSCE region today and indeed the wider world demand more cooperation and more dialogue than ever before. Any argument about going alone is fundamentally flawed in promoting multilateralism, cooperation, and fundamental principles the OSC stands on, parliamentary diplomacy can be a powerful tool. And so, my final message today is, we all need to assume our responsibility. We all need to use the tools in our disposal to make sure that the freezing environment in the OSC area gets some sunshine after all. I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, dear Minister, uh, dear Miroslav, uh, outlining very important priorities, and we see that it's very much in line with our work and uh, with the major issues that we're discussing here in the Parliamentary Assembly, and we count on your tireless efforts and uh, capabilities of your team, uh, Radomir, the Ambassador, and all your team. I think that will be very productive year for the chairmanship and we're looking forward also with our members to have questions and question and answer session with you maybe it could be quite short but it will be for sure uh, now i'd like to ask ambassador graminger secretary general to take floor and deliver his remarks please dear thomas thank you mr president dear george and thank you also for your kind introductory remarks on my behalf. Minister Lajak, Secretary General Montella, distinguished members of the Parliamentary Assembly. Thank you for inviting me to address this distinguished meeting. I appreciate this opportunity to speak with members of the Parliamentary Assembly. I'm going to provide you with an update on developments within the organization and in the OEC region. Last December, the OEC family celebrated its 25th Ministerial Council in Milan, culminating a successful Italian chairmanship. Although the participating states could not find common ground on a political declaration, the quantity and quality of the documents adopted provide some doses of optimism, given the polarized political environment in which we operate. For the first time since 2014, participating states adopted an important decision in the human dimension on the safety of journalists. The decision recognizes that journalists are exposed. They are exposed to intimidation, harassment, and the risk of violence simply for doing their work. It calls on participating states to take effective measures to protect them and their families. The ministerial Declaration on Security and Cooperation in the Mediterranean calls for a strengthened dialogue and cooperation with our Mediterranean partners for cooperation in key areas of common interest, including terrorism, energy security, trafficking in human beings, and gender equality. And it also gives political direction to put relations with our Mediterranean partners higher, higher on the OEC agenda. Participating states also adopted important texts on the role of youth in contributing to peace and security efforts, on digitalization, on combating violence against women, and on combating child trafficking. The overall outcome, I think that is fair to say, was more positive than many of us expected. Ladies and gentlemen, there have also been some positive developments in our region. The successful diplomatic process between Skopje and Athens has opened new possibilities for increased regional cooperation and integration in Southeast Europe. This inspiring exercise deserves recognition and praise. The achievement underscores that 
even after many years without progress, solutions are still possible, and statecraft and diplomacy, statecraft and diplomacy can prevail over populism and nationalism, producing practical outcomes that reinforce security and stability. We have also seen progress on the Transnistrian settlement process, and I hope this will encourage the sites in other conflicts in our region to take steps to improve conditions for the people on the ground, which then could help prepare the path for peaceful settlement. The OEC remains strongly committed to our role in co-chairing the Geneva international discussions, and we also hope to see progress in the Minsk process, working towards a peaceful solution to the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict. The commitment by the leadership of Armenia and Azerbaijan to prepare their populations for peace, I think this is a very promising uh, signal. And here I would like to stress the need to intensify our efforts to work together constructively in all the existing mediation formats. I would also want to mention Central Asia, where a new era of increased regional cooperation and connectivity has begun. This will have a positive impact on the people of the region and it will enhance security and stability in Central Asia and for us all. I hope that the OEC is ready to seize this opportunity and support this, these historic developments. Ladies and gentlemen, despite uh, of all uh, these positive developments, the bigger picture remains worrying. The security situation in the OEC region remains tense, and it is dominated by distrust and by increasing uncertainty. Last week, at the Munich Security Conference, uh, Minister Leitschak has alluded to it, the atmosphere seemed particularly gloomy. As the conference overarching theme so brilliantly put it, the pieces of the international order's puzzle seem to be scattered. Someone will have to put them back into place. I'm convinced that the only possible solution will have to be cooperative and will have to include all stakeholders. In other words, it will have to be multilateral. I'm equally convinced that the OEC could offer a solid frame for putting this, these puzzle pieces together. When I think of the principle and commitments this organization stands for, when I think of the inclusive platform for dialogue and joint action this organization offers, when I think of the tools to prevent manage and resolve conflict. Unfortunately, multilateral institutions are increasingly under attack by a wide range of actors, including prominent world leaders and decision makers. The very idea of multilateralism is in question. But it should be obvious to, our, to us all that the extraordinary complexity of today's international security challenges and the accelerating speed of change caused by the fourth industrial revolution will require joint and will require coordinated action. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, finding a peaceful resolution to the crisis in and around Ukraine remains OEC's top priority. The OEC continues to help de-escalate tensions on the ground and support efforts to find a peaceful solution. I'm concerned that the growing distrust between the sides hinders implementation of the Minsk agreements, which remain the best and for the time being still only pass we have to achieve peace. Tensions over the Azov Sea and Kerch Strait are deeply worrying. On the 26th of November, I issued an early warning to participating states in the Permanent Council calling for restraint and measures of de-escalation. Meaningful dialogue is the only way out. Meanwhile, civilians in eastern Ukraine continue to pay the highest price. The chairperson in office has taken a keen interest in identifying targeted and deliverable measures to help alleviate civilian suffering. So, with the support of the Secretariat, the Special Monitoring Mission to Ukraine, the SMM, 
is increasing its efforts to improve humanitarian conditions. And this, ladies and gentlemen, includes brokering local ceasefires on the ground. More than a thousand uh, last year only to enable repairs to critical infrastructure serving people on both sides of the contact line and preventing further escalation of local ceasefire violations. Ladies and gentlemen, it is often said that international organizations should be more efficient. They should be more effective. I share this assessment. And I agree they need to be reformed. In the OEC context, we need to ensure that the organization remains fit for purpose, fit for purpose to address critical 21st century security challenges. One way we are doing this is by stepping up efforts to achieve gender equality, by enhancing the role of women in preventing and managing conflict, promoting women's contribution to the economy and combating all forms of violence against women and girls. And I'm pleased to announce that on the 8th of March, we will present the main findings of a very comprehensive OEC-led survey on violence against women. We are also looking at ways to strengthen the organization itself. The Secretariat has been improving its ability to provide strategic support to chairmanship, to Troika and participating states by the creation of a strategic policy support unit. And in an effort to enhance the Secretariat's effectiveness, we have undertaken a comprehensive management review supported by Ernst & Young. We have identified multiple areas where we can improve business processes and make better use of scarce resources. In November, we began to implement changes and the transformation process is already yielding concrete results. Successful completion of this transformation process will modernize OEC management policy and practice and ensure that our structures meet contemporary needs. We are also looking forward, looking at ways to reform the organization's cumbersome budget process to attract and retain high quality staff with a specific focus on gender parity, to better mainstream gender and use in our policies and activities, to make better use of technology, mainly of course IT technology, and to more effectively promote the OEC and the impact of our work. A number of initiatives have been tabled for the approval of participating states including reform of the OEC budget process and improvements to the OEC's accounting system. Consensus is still to be reached, but I'm confident that with your support in advocating for reforms like these, we will better position the organization for the future. Ladies and gentlemen, this organization's ability to cope with both old and new challenges largely depends on the availability of human and financial resources. Although threats to our common security continue to grow, some participating states still insist on a zero nominal growth policy for the organization's unified budget. And you know, zero nominal growth does not mean that you simply have the same amount of resources um, uh, available as of last year. Zero normal growth implies that you have every year two to three percent less resources in real terms. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, this is simply not sustainable. If we continue with uh, this policy, it will result in a substantially reduced ability to support you participating states to improve elections and strengthen the rule of law and human rights protection to effectively monitor, prevent, and respond to complex crises in the OEC region, and to tackle transnational threats to security. In short, it will diminish this organization's flexibility and undermine its comprehensive approach, shrinking our organization's ability to contribute to peace and security. So, ladies and gentlemen, please help us to revert this trend. I ask you for your support to ensuring that the OEC receives the resources it needs to succeed. Ladies and gentlemen, let me conclude. 
The unique potential of the OEC is made stronger thanks to close cooperation with the Parliamentary Assembly. Just think of the excellent cooperation the PA has with ODIR, particularly on election observation missions. Relations between the OEC Secretariat and the Parliamentary Assembly are strong and constructive, and they have intensified during the last year, uh, uh, believe me. I often meet with President uh, Zeretelli and Secretary General Montella. Our teams ensure smooth and productive coordination in harmonizing messages for meetings with key stakeholders. Recently, a delegation of the PA Second Committee visited Vienna and met with the coordinator for economic and environmental activities. And in November, the chair of the PA's ad hoc committee on countering terrorism addressed our security committee and held a number of meetings with Secretary staff. Thank you, President Zeretelli. Thank you, Secretary General Montella, for your dedicated efforts to make all this possible. I look forward to continued close collaboration with the PA in the months and years to come. And I'm particularly looking forward to meeting with your bureau in Copenhagen on the 8th of April. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, dear Thomas, uh, Secretary General, for your uh, kind words uh, for that appraisal, what we heard. Uh, you know parliamentarians' work, you know how it's important, and it's not only words that uh, we're trying to, let's say, flatter or please each other, but there are deeds which we see every day, and the uh, governmental side is really open for parliamentarians, and from our side, I'd like to assure that we will support all the good initiatives that you have, a structural reform and all the steps to strengthen this organization to overcome difficulties. And I think it's a very good moment for the chairmanship too, to, to enjoy this very high level of cooperation between the institutions, and we'd like to seize this moment. Thank you again, dear Thomas. Now, before uh, we proceed with our question and answer session, and now I'd like to ask you one thing. So. Uh, we started a little bit late, 15, 20 minutes, so we could add it to, to, to that time, but according to the list of speakers, we only could manage in time if uh, we can shorten time of question for, to, to one minute. I think it's a, it's a question that you will have all possibility to take part in debate, so it's a different thing. I'm very sorry for that, but I know that great orators are in the hall. They can make all, the, all their thoughts quite short. and. Uh, there might be some cases a little bit more, but not, not interventions, the full interventions. So, and before we proceed with our question and answer session, again, I would like to invite the chairman of the Majlis of Parliament, Republic of Kazakhstan, Mr. Nurlan Nigmatulin, to deliver his, uh, his address, and I hope it will be not very long. Uh, Secretary, Gre Secretary Greminger, uh, General Secretary, he said that it's very important to emphasize the importance of cooperation with Central Asia. I've been myself three times in Central Asia last year, and we all are trying to deepen that cooperation to facilitate the reforms, and I saw many impressive things there. So thank you for coming, Mr. Nigmatulin, and we're really eager to hear from you about your endeavors and initiatives to make your countries and the region more developed, democratically and economically. Please, floor is yours, Mr. Speaker. Уважаемые господин председатель, уважаемые дамы и господа, прежде всего позвольте мне от имени делегации парламента Республики Казахстан поприветствовать всех участников сегодняшнего заседания и выразить признательность председателю парламентской ассамблеи Организации по безопасности и сотрудничеству Европы господину Георгию Церетели и австрийской стороне председателю Национального совета парламента Австрии господину Вольгану Саботке за теплый и радушный прием и высокую организацию мероприятия. Хотел бы выразить поддержку приоритетам словацкого председательства, которые представил господин Мирослав Лайчик, и которые, уверен, будут способствовать продвижению диалога, продвижению доверия и стабильности на пространстве ОБСЕ. 
Вот уже более четверти века парламентская ассамблея организации по безопасности и сотрудничеству в Европе является эффективной площадкой для обсуждения актуальных вопросов развития регионального сотрудничества. И сегодня, когда мир переживает трудные времена, когда чрезвычайно важна политическая воля, которая позволит коллективно и конструктивно работать над общей повесткой дня по всем аспектам европейской безопасности. Дорогие друзья, как вам хорошо известно, Казахстан был организатором пока единственного в этом столетии саммита ОБСЕ в Астане в 2010 году. Тогда государства-участники приняли Астанинскую декларацию, в которой подтвердили свое видение свободного, демократического, общего и неделимого евроатлантического и евразийского сообщества безопасности. Однако, понимая, что геополитическая ситуация в мире динамично меняется, президент Казахстана Нурсултан Назарбаев, считая необходимым обновление Хельсинского заключительного акта 1975 года предложил провести в 2020 году в Астане конференцию по безопасности и сотрудничеству, приуроченную 45-летию принятия данного стратегического документа. И сегодня с этой высокой трибуны хочу поблагодарить руководство парламентской ассамблеи ОБСЕ за поддержку данной инициативы президента Казахстана. Уважаемые коллеги, вы хорошо знаете, что Казахстан с момента обретения своей независимости активно участвует в работе ОБСЕ по всем трем измерениям деятельности организации. В рамках военно-политического измерения мы поддерживаем многосторонние усилия по обеспечению евроатлантической и евразийской безопасности, укреплению мер доверия, урегулированию затяжных конфликтов. В связи с этим у нас вызывает обеспокоенность распространение таких транснациональных угроз, как международный терроризм, незаконный оборот наркотиков, торговля людьми и кибератаки. На наш взгляд, сегодня необходимо принятие мер коллективного и только коллективного противодействия этим вызовам и угрозам со стороны государств-участников ОБСЕ. И именно поэтому актуальная инициатива президента Казахстана Нурсултана Назарбаева о создании глобальной контртеррористической сети под эгидой Организации Объединенных Наций. Сегодня необходима выработка практических мер по выявлению, задержанию и экстрадиции террористов. 28 сентября прошлого года в Нью-Йорке был подписан инициированный президентом Казахстана кодекс поведения по достижению мира свободного терроризма. На сегодняшний день к кодексу присоединились более 70 стран. Если говорить о втором экономико-экологическом измерении, то для нас большое значение имеет формирование трансконтинентальных транспортных коридоров, объединяющих Европу и Азию. Именно эти коридоры обеспечивают устойчивое развитие всех регионов, всех государств, находящихся на этом пути. В этом направлении продолжается совместная работа в области охраны окружающей среды, в том числе в решении проблемы Аральского моря, эффективного управления водными ресурсами во всей Центральной Азии. В третьем человеческом измерении для нас очень важны такие вопросы сотрудничества, как соблюдение прав человека, в частности борьба со всеми формами нетерпимости и дискриминации, вопросы верховенства закона, независимости судебной системы, толерантности и продвижения гендерного баланса. Уважаемые дамы и господа, в условиях современного глобального мира, когда Европа и Азия – это по сути уже единое географическое, единое политическое пространство, переплетенное множеством исторических, экономических и культурных связей, система безопасности и сотрудничества не может рассматриваться уже как чисто европейская. Поэтому Президент Казахстана выдвинул инициативу провести совместное консультативное заседание ОБСЕ, СВНДА и регионального форума АСИАН по вопросам безопасности. Полагаем, что такое заседание позволит выработать общие подходы для конструктивного взаимодействия в этой очень важной сфере. И здесь особую актуальность приобретает парламентское измерение как важная составляющая международного сотрудничества. Именно в целях укрепления прямого многостороннего диалога между руководителями парламентов государств Евразии мы планируем проведение 23-24 сентября этого года в Астане 
четвертого совещания спикеров парламентов стран Европы и Азии на тему «Большая Евразия. Диалог, доверие, партнерство». Данное мероприятие является продолжением представительных форумов, успешно прошедших в Москве, Сеуле и Анталии. Приглашение участвовать в данном форуме направлено руководителям парламентов стран Европы и Азии, руководителям международных парламентских организаций. И на сегодняшний день многие из них уже официально подтвердили свое участие. Уверен, что выработанные на этом представительном совещании спикеров Евразии предложения и инициативы послужат дальнейшему укреплению доверия и взаимопонимания между странами и народами нашего континента. В заключение, дорогие друзья, хочу пожелать всем нам успешной работы и плодотворной дискуссии, ибо только через конструктивный диалог, только через эффективное взаимодействие мы сможем совместными усилиями обеспечить комплексную безопасность на пространстве ОБСЕ. Благодарю за внимание. So, thank you, dear uh, speaker, dear Nurlan, for your comments, for your speech, and uh, as I said, and I think it's a desire of Assembly to continue active engagement from the OSC side to the region and especially with Kazakhstan. Now, dear colleagues, uh, we will start our question and session, question and answer session. As I said, is a maximum time we could allocate uh, 20 minutes. So, uh, without any continuation, I'd like to ask Artur Gerasim of Ukraine first question. Up to one minute, please. Thank you. Uh, two short questions to Minister Lajcik and Ambassador Greminger. Uh, to Minister Lajcik. In the ongoing Russian aggression against Ukraine, one of the most severe humanitarian consequences is the use by Russia of illegally detained Ukrainian citizens as hostages. Recently, our colleague, Deputy Chair of uh, Ukrainian Parliament Irina Gerashenko, wrote to you requesting your personal involvement. We are ready to return to Russia convicted Russian citizens and want return of Ukrainian hostages. Two days ago you were in Moscow. Did you manage to achieve progress in this important humanitarian issue? And to Ambassador Greminger, as Chief Administrative Officer of the OSCE, you are responsible for the efficient use of the OSCE resources. In the Russia-occupied part of Ukraine, Crimea and Donbass, the Russian Occupation Administration denies access of the OSCE special monitoring mission either completely as in Crimea or predominantly as in Donbass. In the last four months, the Russian forces in Donbass downed two long-range UAV of the special monitoring mission, the second just three days ago. What are your steps, Secretary General, to stop such impediments and get financial compensation from Russia for lost UAVs? And uh, one comment. In the Kerch Strait, not tension. It was military open attack of Russian forces against Ukrainian vessels in the international waters with use of helicopters, aircrafts, guns with skill to fire. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Sofia Katsarava, Georgia. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, thanks to all speakers for very interesting and visionary speeches. Uh, and once again, congratulations to the Foreign Minister of Slovakia on the assumptions of the chairmanship, uh, chairmanship duties. Uh, it was our pleasure to meet you in Georgia uh, not long ago, and we certainly welcome all the priorities uh, that you've laid out, uh, particularly the ones uh, which uh, seek to address, uh, mitigate, and prevent conflict and vital important, of course, uh, to focus on the needs of people. Um, I believe that your visit at the same time was a continuous demonstration that Georgia remains high on the OSC uh, agenda and uh, your visit to the occupation line in particular uh, reminds everybody how imminent and vivid uh, is the security threat, which is not just a threat uh, to Georgia, uh, but this is a threat and concern to entire and much wider region. So back to the question now, which is also in line with your priorities and to a certain extent is a follow-up to your visit to Georgia, as we also had extensive discussions about that. What would be specific uh, actions that we could jointly certainly come up with, opportunities or possibilities okay. likewise, to address the concerns of those people who are residing on the occupied territories, as well as the ones and certainly deprived of all fundamental and basic rights and the ones who have been expelled 
from Georgia, Abkhazia, and South Ossetia uh, during the, the several waves of forcible displacement. Uh, that is a very specific question, I understand, but something that we could uh, jointly discuss. And I would like to also express hope that future chairs of OSCE will also keep Georgia high on the agenda precisely to address the concerns of the people. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Dobre. Romania. Thank you. What actions are considered within the OSSA in response to the recent provocation by Tiraspol, namely the opening of so-called representation of Transnistria in Moscow? We regard such action as contrary to the principle of sovereignty and territorial integrity of the Republic of Moldova and undermining the ongoing process of negotiations in the framework of 5 plus 2 format. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, Margaret Kennan Ellen, Switzerland. Thank you. I would like to thank uh, Mr. Chairperson in office and uh, Secretary General for their priorities, for their good coordination, and also for their emphasis to include more women on all levels of our institutions. This remark would also concern our special monitoring mission. As a head of the third commission, I was able to lead a fact-finding mission in December to Kiev, Dnipro, Mariupol, and over to the uh, contact line. Um, ceasefire increased the mining activities and full compliance with international humanitarian law by all sides is for us as Human Rights Committee of crucial importance. My questions to you, and I will put them in a language of my country in French. Monsieur le Ministre, Monsieur le Président, en, Monsieur le Président en exercice, Monsieur Gréminier, nous ne pouvons pas continuer à rester passifs et de facto nous limiter à administrer ce conflit armé plutôt qu'activement tenter de le résoudre. Ne serait-il pas temps de donner à la mission spéciale d'observation de l'OSCE en, en Ukraine un cadre plus large qui permettrait de contribuer à la mise en œuvre des accords de Minsk Je vous remercie. Okay. Okay, uh, thank you. Then uh, Haiti Fry. Oh, no, 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 sorry. Seven more board, France, and then Haiti Fry. Thank you very much, uh, Chair. I, I wanted to address my. No, the, oh, after, <laughs> so, sorry. Yes, Seren, Seren Mourborn, France. Okay, uh, oh, you are there, sorry. Please. Ah, Madame Bonneau, vas-y. Oh, Monsieur le Président, le comité ad hoc de lutte contre le terrorisme de notre Assemblée auquel j'appartiens est venu étudier la législation et l'expérience française relative à la gestion des revenants au mois de février. Je salue l'initiative de notre délégation et encourage le comité dans ses travaux, notamment celui de proposer une boîte à outils et des bonnes pratiques à tous les États membres de notre organisation. La France commence à avoir de l'expérience en ce domaine, toutefois, jusqu'alors, elle n'a été confrontée qu'à des retours ponctuels, échelonnés, plus faciles à gérer. Or, les récentes annonces des États-Unis nous laissent penser que la France devra bientôt gérer des retours en bloc. La France, très lourdement touchée par ce terrorisme, prend ses responsabilités et sa position est claire en ce domaine. Les enfants nés en France ou de parents français ont vocation à retrouver leur famille en France. Or, la France n'est pas le seul pays concerné. En cela, la gestion des revenants est un défi commun. Que vont devenir les combattants étrangers qui ne seront pas rapatriés par leur pays d'origine Ils seront libérés, pourront commettre d'autres tueries. Nous avons une responsabilité collective de protection de nos concitoyens contre ces fanatiques. Ma question est la suivante, Monsieur le Secrétaire Général. Que fait l'OSCE pour soutenir les démarches telles que celles de la France, pour inciter les États à suivre la même démarche ou éviter que des terroristes non rapatriés puissent être libérés Je vous remercie. Thank you. So, thank you. Merci beaucoup. Now, uh, Heidi Fry. Heidi. 
Uh, uh, thank you, President. I just wanted to uh, address my question to um, the Chairman in Office, Mr. Lightrack. I wanted to say that it is important, and I, I support his, 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 his focusing on youth and on the, the diaspora and the whole cross-section of youth, which is LGBTQ youth, migrant youth, etc. Because youth make up 38% of the OSC PA region, and therefore when they do not have jobs and when they are stereotyped as being terrorists and as being radicalized, I think we don't get to the heart of what it is about. The idea of putting youth at the forefront of creating opportunity for all and creating progressive uh, nation states is important. So I wanted to ask him, have you, if you've seen the United Nations study and its recommendations on youth insecurity, do you intend to implement or to try and, and use those recommendations as a basis for your report? And are you going to look at the whole concept of youth, meaning women, um, LGBTQ, migrants, etc., to be able to deal with this issue? Thank you very much, Haiti. Uh, now, Richard Hudson, United States. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, to Chair and Office Lychak, um, we welcome Salakia's stewardship of the OSCE this year, and thank you for taking on this considerable task. It is fortuitous that Salakia's chairmanship coincides with the anniversary of the Velvet Revolution. Um, we look forward to the opportunity to commemorate appropriately that historic event. I think I can speak for all uh, parliamentarians here when I say we're troubled uh, by the rise of anti-Semitism we've seen uh, uh, making headlines recently. I want to commend you for hosting the conference on anti-Semitism in February. Uh, we, we welcome any additional information you can share about other events or activities the chairmanship may be planning for later in the year uh, regarding tolerance and non-discrimination issues including Christians, Muslims, and other faiths, uh, as well as racism and xenophobia. Uh, secondly, I would just ask will you ensure that civil society has access to the upcoming ministerial in Slovakia in December. With that, I yield back, Mr. President. Thank you very much, dear Richard. Uh, now, Ms. Du Mr. Dunava. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And we will, yes. Uh, will the OAC consider to put uh, in its agenda measures and the negotiation with the relevant actors involved in the context of the intensification of the unauthorized military exercises that have taken place in last year in the security zone of the Republic of Moldova? Uh, our question is based on the evidence that such activities do not contribute to the confidence-building measures in question, uh, the real efficiency of the small steps approach. Thank you. Thank you indeed. Uh, and then, uh, is Bono, Ms. Bonavandom still wants to, but it was already, I think. Uh, Fatmir Mediu. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. In your presentation, you, met, uh, you mentioned that, unfortunately, we have protests in Tirana. How is uh, OSC Parliamentary Assembly will involve himself in uh, the matters of uh, request for free and fair election, fighting against organized crime and corruption, in order, you know, to find out a solution out of that protest? Second, about, you know, questions for Mr. Lychak. Recently, we have heard a lot of discussions about border change and land swamp in between Kosovo and Serbia, which uh, brings me to some concerns of going back on the dark times of conflicts and a kind of domino effect in the region. So what is going to be the role of uh, you know, your chairmanship on, on that matter? Thank you very much. And very last question, Colin Deacon from Canada. Thank you, Chair. Um, I want to focus on one of the priorities, uh, Minister Lechek, of um, the Slovakia's chairmanship, the promotion of, pol of policies and activities to capitalize on the positive effect impacts of technology while mitigating the negative effects. Technology and business disruption are commonplace in every corner of the globe, and we've all seen evidence of the uh, resulting economic and social disruption that, uh, that follows and how it can lead to a divisive fracturing inside communities and societies. But the reverse can also be true. And my personal background as an entrepreneur, I encourage you to look at technology and technology entrepreneurship as an effective tool to create the sorts of success stories that can reverse the effects of economic and social disruption. And so my question to you is, is uh, uh, in light of the benefits of technology entrepreneurship, how might the chairmanship, the chairperson in office propose to use this approach uh, as you go about your important work at the OSCE? Thank you. 
Thank you very much, dear colleagues. You were very good uh, in, a, in a reducing time over questions. And please now, uh, Chairman in office and maybe also the Secretary General, if you want. It's a big, big challenge, I understand. Uh, 13 or 14 questions altogether. I'd like to thank you for your uh, questions, comments, and for your interest in the work of the organization and priorities of our chairmanship and try to answer very briefly. First, the issue about the detained persons. I uh, did raise this issue uh, in my meetings with Mr. Lavrov not only last Tuesday in Moscow but also during my previous visit in uh, October when I uh, spoke about Oleg Sensov. This time I I raised the issue of, uh, of the seamen and also uh, one of the commitments of the Minsk agreement which is the exchange of prisoners. And uh, I've urged the uh, Russian side to, uh, to be constructive on this issue, so time will, time, time will show uh, how successful we were. But uh, we definitely never missed the opportunity to raise these issues. Uh, on the issue from, the question from Georgia, uh, I think we've discussed this uh, during my recent visit. We have mechanisms, Geneva Interna International Dialogues and IPRM measures, it's really important that they prove their usefulness and we must make sure that these vehicles that have been created are there and, and deliver results. Step by step, this is where we are, but uh, there should be no stagnation or going back on this. On the, uh, the, the Romanian question about the actions from Tiraspol, it is really important that we, and I, I, I mentioned it explicitly in my speech, we need to avoid unilateral actions. We have a momentum in Transnistrian settlement process the, the, the package Berlin Plus is being implemented. I urge both parties to make sure that this momentum is preserved. And I'm gl also glad that uh, after interventions, the initial idea about setting up this office was, was changed. Uh, the status was uh, basically downgraded to an NGO and the symbols were removed. So I really believe that it helped to, to calm down the atmosphere. Uh, about uh, the Swiss uh, question first, obviously I'm f fully in favor of the inclusion of women in all our activities and it's not a coincidence, I made a point about it. Uh, with regard to the uh, broader framework or rather mandate for the SMM, I agree very much with you, the, but the OSC operates on the basis of consensus. So uh, I'm sure that uh, the mission is uh, willing to do more provided it gets the mandate from uh, the participating states. So the, uh, the, the question from Canada about the youth and security report. Well, I happened to be the president of the United Nations General Assembly last year, and I, youth was one of my priorities, and I organized two events related to youth, and uh, right now we are bringing some positive experience from the UN into the OSC environment and, and promotion and inclusion of youth is among them. And when I speak about a safer future, that means youth should be part of it because the youth is the future, so we, we definitely we organize uh, several events with the inclusion and participation of young people. Uh, United States, thank you very much for your uh, nice comments. We've enjoyed the visit of Secretary Pompeo last week to Bratislava, which was very constructive. I call it a visit of encouragement. It is not a coincidence that we chose uh, combating uh, uh, anti-Semitism as the theme for our very first high-level conference, and we will continue uh, promoting tolerance and uh, fighting against uh, discrimination, uh, including with regard to Christians and Muslims, and in, to promote the area of zero tolerance to discrimination in the, within the OSC area. And uh, the issue of the civil society's access is, uh, yes, it was raised in Milan. We've took a good note of it. We have a good history of working with our civil society organizations. They are our partners, and we will make sure that they will take part uh, uh, in, uh, in our ministerial council. On the land swap, I have a very strong opinion on it, and I, uh, I do, do not keep it secret, but I don't think I should make it public here in, with wearing my OSC hat, because this is not an OSC process, not uh, the OSC agenda. It's uh, the process being discussed within the European Union and uh, together with the, with the United States. So uh, if the OSC is asked to be part of this process, we will do my, our best. Uh, I will only limit myself by saying that uh, I don't think that changing the borders solves the problem. Uh, and the issue of technology, it's very interesting, and I would wish to hear more about it. What we, how, how can you bring your entrepreneurial experience into our work, and we'll be all open for that. 
Thank you very much. Thank you, Thomas. Yeah, just uh, uh, complementing uh, on a few points. Foreign terrorist fighters, this is uh, a key uh, and a key issue on the agenda of the Security Committee, um, the Security Committee, but also the Permanent Council, both serving as a platform to exchange uh, on good practices. Um, the Transnational Threats Department of uh, the Secretariat offers uh, expertise to participating states um, on how to address uh, these issues. So uh, I can reassure you that this is uh, an item that is very high on our uh, agenda. Um, just complementing on the UN study uh, on, on use and security. This study has been presented uh, here in Vienna uh, to the group of friends uh, 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 chaired uh, by the Spanish ambassador um, and the study calls on regional organizations uh, uh, to implement uh, recommendations and that is uh, definitely what we are uh, aiming at. Um, on the question by the Ukrainian uh, uh, delegate, we of course regret uh, all freedom of movement restrictions uh, to the SMM, uh, non-respect uh, for OEC monitors and for OEC assets, and this includes uh, charming and shooting at UAVs. Uh, uh, at all UAVs, eh? short, mid, long range, uh, there is charming and shooting at, at all uh, types of uh, UAVs. Um, we regret uh, that the second long range UAV was downed uh, a few uh, days ago. We take uh, this uh, very seriously. This is currently being investigated and uh, uh, once uh, we know more about the reasons uh, of uh, the UAV coming down, we would certainly also try uh, to uh, um, make those responsible uh, for it uh, accountable. Last point on uh, the female representation in the special monitoring mission. Uh, this is a, a challenging uh, a, a challenge because we are looking uh, for a lot of hard security related expertise. But here again, I can reassure you that we've been uh, successfully uh, attacking the issues lately and the figures are clearly going up uh, by specifically targeting uh, uh, pools uh, uh, of fema female experts in participating states. Thank you. So, thank you very much. Uh, uh, I, th I think on behalf of my colleagues, uh, we'd like to uh, thank you, uh, dear Chairman, the Secretary General, for being today with us and uh, sharing with your plans and with your will to work closely with parliamentarians. We really appreciate that. And we have also the same position from our side. Uh, if there are any questions, you can always, uh, you know, send it uh, in, a, in, a, in a written form, but we let all of you who were in list to ask questions. And thank you very, very much again, dear Miroslav, dear Minister, and dear Thomas, to responding to the questions of parliamentarians. Thank you for very good cooperation, and many thanks to our interpreters, because they worked a little bit more than it was designated. So, big applause to everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh,